Well, good morning again, friends. Indeed, this day, this beautiful October, dreary, rain-soaked, leaf-long-covered day <laughs> is indeed a great day as each of us draws breath into our lungs and has strength in our limbs and soundness of mind. Each opportunity we have those three things is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I see a few folks I, I have recognized from years of pastoring. I'm not going to call them out by name, embarrassing them, uh, but I just want them to know I see you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having her and bringing her here today. Today, friends, we conclude our sermon series entitled Actions of an Active Church. In this previous six parts, we have learned that an active church discerns God's purpose, is patient with the vision that God births, that it seeks to speak the contextual and cultural language of the people it serves, that it empowers its people to empower others, that it teaches its people the value of honesty, authenticity, and integrity, that it is committed to spiritual development and social concerns, and it stretches itself beyond its preconceptions and misconceptions to serve those God sends to them to serve. And so our concluding and culminating message this day, friends, is simply this, purpose, not preference. Purpose, not preference. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to this time where you can impart to us, speak to us, and plant within us a word that will encourage, that will convict, that will equip. We open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul, that we might be yielded instruments in your hand to share your good news with those around us, that it's all about you, Lord, and not about us, that we remove those things that are hindrances that prevent us from sharing with those who cross our path with joy and compassion. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Friends, we all have preferences. We prefer different flavors of ice cream. Some like chocolate, some like vanilla, some like strawberry, some like Rocky Roll, some like pistachio, uh, some even like Superman, and some like pralines and cream. Don't you want some ice cream now? <laughs> we prefer different genres of music. Some of you still love doo-wop and classic rock and R&B and jazz and gospel and contemporary gospel, classical music. We have different preferences. We prefer different restaurants. Some of you swear by Morton's and others you swear by Ruth Chris. Indeed, we even have preferences in our communities of faith. Some prefer the Gothic architecture of old buildings, while others prefer the modern design that is sweeping our nation. Some prefer hymns and praise songs over anthems, or they prefer gospel. We all have preferences. Having a preference is not necessarily a challenge nor a problem. The challenge, however, comes when we try to make our preferences the mandate for everyone else. Everyone has to like chocolate ice cream if you want to be my friend. Everyone has to do the same thing I do. Everyone has to like that team in Ann Arbor. Indeed, friends, our preferences are not a problem. It becomes a problem when we try to mandate our preference as the only way that you can do and believe. We find our nation gripped by a sense of polarization where it's if you don't believe and think the same way I do, obviously you are evil. And we use those kind of terms to talk about people that we've known our whole lives, that have seen the best and worst times with us, but we've gotten to this place where we cannot disagree, where we can't say, my preference does not need to be mandated for any and everyone else. Indeed, friends, as people of faith, we are called to place God's purpose above our preferences to make our personal preferences less than and make God's purpose the dominant motivating driving factor where we value and provide alternatives even if we don't like them ourselves but we find that God calls us to do that so that others might come to know God 
as we have come to know God. We recognize that God's purpose is often broader than our preferences, and so we lean to God's purpose over our preferences. Chapter 11 of Acts takes us to the aftermath of Peter's visit to Cornelius. You knew there was going to have to be an aftermath of the visit. He has this opportunity where he has his worldview shifted, his belief system shifted, and he's enabled to share the gospel of Christ with Cornelius, and all Cornelius has gathered in his home. We have this image in chapter 10 where he's having this vision of a sheet, of picnic blanket being lowered down with all the stuff that he's not supposed to eat, and the challenge to him is to eat this because what you call unclean, I'm calling clean. I'm shifting your worldview so that you can see and explore and share with others that which I want to share with them without letting your preferences get in the way. Yet as he returns from Cornelius' home, the text tells us some of the apostles, some of the other religious leaders, some of the other folks in the church have some questions, have some criticism, have some critique of him. And they asked him the question, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Indeed, remember for an upright and upstanding Jew, you didn't associate with Gentiles and unbelievers, those who you thought were unworthy or unclean. Now they hear one of their leaders, one of their more vocal leaders, not only has talked with them, but has spent time with them, went to a house, sat down, and broke bread with them. So they've got a question. Why did you do that? You, you know the rules. You know what the expectations is. You know what our preferences are. We don't do that. We don't have that kind of understanding. Why did you do that? And so Peter begins to recount the whole story for them. I love how Peter does this. I'm not going to give you the quick answer. I'm going to give you the long roundabout story. One of the things that used to drive me and my brother crazy uh, when we would do homework is we'd ask our mother for a definition. And she says, all right, I'm going to tell you where the definition is. Go to the bookshelf. There's a book called a dictionary. I want you to pull a dictionary off the shelf. I want you to look up in that dictionary the word that you're looking for, and you will find the definition. We just want you to tell us what the word means. Why are you sending us through this process? Because the process of going to find it for yourself helps you broaden your perspective on where you can find answers. And so Peter tells them the whole story so that they would understand this was not a fly-by-night thing. This was not something I did without calculating it. This was not something that I did without having a conversation with the Lord. And the same transformation that I have, I'm going to offer to you. And he says that, yes, I was sitting on the rooftop. I had myself a dream of some good home-cooked food. And I was saying to myself, mm, that will sure be good. And then the Lord brought to my attention some stuff that I wasn't supposed to eat. And I said, Lord, I can't eat that. And he says, why not? Why? My doctor told me I can't eat that. Your doctor said, don't eat it. And tons he said moderation so you can have a slice of cake just not a whole half cake <laughs> and so as me and the Holy Spirit have this conversation three men come up and they say hey we looking for Peter are you Peter he's like yeah I'm Peter who are you uh, we came from this dude named Cornelius and Cornelius wants to talk to you uh, who's Cornelius and is this a scam But the Lord has dealt with Peter, and Peter says, the Lord told me that I could go ahead and have conversation with people that I thought was unclean because God says they are clean, and if God says they're clean, who am I to say they're not? So I went with the men, and I came into the house, and I thought I was just going to meet with Cornelius the Centurion, but Cornelius had invited all his people, his grandkids, his great-grandkids, his cousin and them. He invited friends. He invited enemies. He invited everybody, and I walked into the house, and I said, oh, Lord, this is a setup. But no, they're sitting there waiting to hear me proclaim the gospel, and when I proclaimed the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and it was just like it fell on us, and I said to myself, if God says this can be shared with them, who am I to say it can't? And the text says that the people who heard this had two reactions. You know there are always going to be two reactions. There are those who celebrate it, and there are those who are convicted by it. It says that those who heard it were silenced. You know, the best way to silence some of your critics and some of the people who have negative things to say about you is to operate in the grace and love of God so they can't say anything and just sit there and realize what we thought we were going to do, we can't do. And then those who are celebrating saying, hey, if God now opens the table for everybody, 
That means God is so much more than what we imagine. And that's the truth, friends. God is bigger than the box we put God in. God has bigger plans than the plans we think God has for us. God's vision is so more expansive than what we can ever imagine that we have to say to ourselves, am I limiting God because I don't feel comfortable? Or is God limiting himself to make me feel comfortable? In either case, friends, there's limitation where God says there needs to be expanse. An active church recognizes and teaches and values the vision and mission and purpose of God over its personal preferences. An active church humbles itself, recognizing that if God is using a vehicle or a mechanism to reach people, it must not put, put its own personal preferences above God's purpose. And that's hard for us. Because I like what I like. And I want others to like what I like so I don't have to change what I like. I want everybody to like chocolate ice cream so all I have to do is buy one gallon of ice cream at the grocery store instead of three. I like everyone to like the same thing I like so I don't have to change and broaden my perspective because I've gotten to a place where I don't want that, that perspective to be too broad. I, I don't want to have to give up things that I love. But, but here's the thing about preference and God's purpose. God's purpose never says you have to give up your preference. It says you can't make your preference dominant. Your preference can't come before God's purpose. Yes, you can have a preference, and we make allowances for that. And what I've learned in growing churches is growing churches have an opportunity for people of different preferences to have an expression and to feel that expression come alive. That it isn't just this way or that way. It's this and that. It's the both and. To use conflict resolution terms, it's win-win kind of thinking. And that's what God calls us to do as the people of faith is to think win-win, not win-lose, my way or your way. If it's not my way, if it's not my preference, then that means I'm being overlooked and forgotten. No. It means you're thinking about a future beyond yourself. When we think about legacy planning and you go to your attorneys and you think about your children and your grandchildren, you're not saying to yourself, I'm going to die and all of the things I love are going to die with me. No, you're saying to yourself, I've got grandchildren and great-grandchildren that I want to leave a legacy for. I want them to understand and have the abilities to do some things I wasn't able to do. And so you go and sit with your attorney to make plans for a future where you're not going to be here so that you might be a blessing to someone who you may not ever see. Now there are some in here who not only have seen your great grandchildren, but have seen great, great grandchildren. But your great, great, great grandmother and grandfather didn't see you most times, but they still prepared a place, still prepared something in advance for you. You have that quilt in your house now, that armoire in your house now that was passed down from generation to generation so that you might remember and have a treasured heirloom. That's what we're called to do. The prioritization of God's purpose over our personal preferences is exemplified in a story that George Acevedo tells in his book, Vital Churches Changing Community in the World. Pastor Acevedo is discerning of his church, Grace Church, Grace United Methodist Church in Florida, that there needs to be uh, some shifts, there needs to be some new things happening. And so he goes to one of his senior members and he asks them a very poignant question about pur purpose or preference. He asks them this question. Will you pay for and pray for ministry you don't understand or like if it will get your grandkids in church? Will you pay for and pray for ministry you don't understand or like if it means your grandkids will come to find relationship with God? The question that he's asking him is about purpose and not preference. Peter's response to his critics offer them an opportunity to come along with him, to shift their worldview, to remain attached to the historic viewpoint that they had, or to shed it in order to see something greater. It's one thing to say all of us here are wonderful, it's all of us here are a part of the family, but what would it look like if this place was so packed that you had to get here 30 minutes early, not only to find a parking spot, but to find a seat? 
And while on one hand we're saying, yeah, that'd be great. On the other hand, you're saying, but I like my seat. And I like being able to come and find a parking spot. And I like knowing most of the faces that I see in this space. And that is the challenge that we wrestle with. Indeed, friends, the response that Peter's statement gives to them is what God wants us to have. When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. It's not our responsibility to decide who is and who isn't worthy. It's not our responsibility to make sure that our preferences are maintained, especially at the expense of God's purpose. It is our responsibility to make sure that others come and meet the one who's changed our lives forever. So an active church has some things that it does. It discerns God's purpose. It's patient with God's vision. It seeks to speak the contextual and cultural language of the people that it serves. It empowers its people to empower others, to teach its people the values of honesty, authenticity, and integrity. It's committed to spiritual development and the social concerns of its community. It stretches itself beyond its preconceived notions and misconceptions to serve those God, who, God who's called them to serve. And it chooses God's purpose over personal preference. Those are the actions of an active church. And every church says the same thing. We want to be a growing church. We want to see more young families. We want to see more children. We want to see it. Are we willing to be an active church? Are we willing to put ourselves to the side to provide space for others? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.